AI tools have pretty much taken over the developer world from things like Copilot to other lesser known ones like the one I'm going to talk about today. But speaking of that one, it did catch my eye. I have been generally avoiding these things because I didn't want to like corrupt my own knowledge or whatever. Uh, but this one caught my eye and it was particularly interesting. So I tried it and now I'm making a video about it. Essentially, it is a free alternative to GitHub Copilot. I know what you're thinking. Free service and AI service actually are already uh, red flags on their own, but a free AI service, could that possibly work? I decided to find out for myself, so I used it for a few weeks and I'm going to be telling you what I think about it. We're also going to be addressing some of the potential concerns around it and we're also going to be showing off how it works. Of course, if you find this video helpful at any point, then consider liking it to let me know and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like it. If you're feeling particularly generous, you could become a member or a patron using the links in the description below. But with all that out of the way, let's find out what this thing is all about. So here we are on the main website. It's quite a nice looking website actually. And you'll see if I go to this pricing tab that it is indeed free forever uh, on an individual tier. And then you have your teams tier, which is uh, £12 per seat per month and then enterprise, which is, you know, the, the sort of thing where you'd have a huge company and the price needs to be determined on the actual usage. And for those skeptical of how you know people could provide an AI for free, uh, business models like this aren't uncommon at all. You know, even huge things like Jira. I don't know if anyone's used Jira. Um, I, I imagine a lot of you have probably used Jira now I think about it because uh, everyone uses Jira. Uh, but they do have a free tier for, I think it's small teams. I think you can have up to five on Jira. For Codium, it is just the one seat. So the one user, so it is individuals only. But having a, a free tier for very light usage, so a small team or individuals, and then making all your money on teams and enterprise offerings is not uncommon. Um, and this is actually what they talk about in their FAQ because I did do a number, of, well, I did do quite a bit of research into this because I too was skeptical about how they could offer an API for free or sorry, an AI for free. And basically the idea is they make it off the enterprise offering. So larger teams will provide all the money and then they could provide a lower level uh, free tier. It is a little bit more basic than what you pay for if you're in a team. But you get a free tier of individuals to use. They make their money off teams and enterprise. If enough individuals use it for free, then their companies might be aware of it. And then they might sign up. So they might end up actually making a profit from individuals using it because the teams then take it on. And it kind of goes on that word of mouth uh, system. But they say that they are committed to providing the free tier for individuals forever, which is cool if true. But if you wanna know about how these services do tend to work, I am not really that put off by the fact it's free, bearing in mind it is the enterprise offering they're making the money for, that makes sense to me. The other thing is data and such, about how they actually collect the data. And the short of it is they don't do anything worse than GitHub Copilot does. Um, so there isn't any you know, private code, there isn't any user code, so you can use it on your uh, code base and it won't take from the code base, especially if it's private, uh, which is good because obviously, you know, corporations, uh, a lot of them, you know, the company I work for, for example, is closed source uh, and it would be quite bad if we sent all of that off to an AI. <laughs> um, so it's good that that's the thing. A uh, little, if I go back into the FAQ... There were questions down here. Do, 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 do. There we go. Uh, so this one and this one. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't really go to take private codes. Uh, and then for, where was it? Uh, Codium's underlying model was trained on publicly available natural language and source code data, including code in public repositories. Codium will never train its generative models on private or user code. And down here it says, it does mention that it does collect telemetry data such as latency, engagement and all that just for its own purposes, but it doesn't sell any of it or anything like that. Um, and your levels of trust will obviously differ from mine. Like from what I'm reading here, I'm fine with what I'm seeing. But I did want to address that before we got into anything because I know that a lot of people when they saw the title or the thumbnail would have immediately thought, hmm, Okay, well, what's the catch here? So the actual functionality of the system doesn't differ much from Copilot as far as I could tell. I've never used Copilot before. I've known people that have used it. I've seen it in videos and such. And from what I can tell, it's not that different. I don't think it's quite as powerful, but I don't think it's that different. 
So the whole autocomplete system works similarly. So if we were to do uh, import numpy as mp, for example, and if we do def random uh, or array, you'll see the autocomplete is starting to kick in already. And if we take a size of an int, and then what it was doing before, it was giving me a type hint before. There we go. And you can see the autocomplete then filled in the following line. If we were to get rid of this and do a doc string, uh, so return a random array of the given size, and if we were to do a condition, say if size is zero, return an empty array, it kind of already knows what I want to do here. If we go down here, it will eventually, there we go. So it's not super quick, and you do also kind of have to guide it through. So on its website, it shows it generating blocks of code at a time. I cannot for the life of me get it to do that. And I don't know if it's a setting I've done or whether VS Code just randomly doesn't support it, but I can only get it to generate one line at a time. So whether that's a problem for you or not, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, if we were to actually test this though, so if I do if and then name equals main and then do that. So if we tested it with zero, then you can see it's an empty array. If we tested it with five, you can see it's now giving us five random elements. It does have some other capabilities as well. So if we were to uh, select this, right click and hit refactor selected code block, that's gonna be really small on the screen. We could do this and then we get a series of things that we can do. So we can add comments and doc strings to the code. I'm gonna show that off with some other code later. Add print statements, add type annotations, clean up the code, check for bugs, etc., etc., etc. Or we can actually, run our own command on this. So if I, if I think it's in the command palette, yeah. Uh, so if I do update this function to return values between one and 10 inclusive, and I haven't done something like this before, so we're gonna see how well it does. Uh, okay, so it, yeah, it gives you a diff, basically of what it's gonna do. So it seems, uh, if I accept it, there we go. Yeah, it's, it's diff view is a bit weird, but if I do that, it should now. Uh, oh, I haven't saved it. That'd be why that hasn't worked. There you go. So just with that one command, it's now giving us an array of the size that we gave it, but it's now been updated. So it gives us a number between one and 10. So you can do that sort of refactoring stuff in the code. Uh, to test out some of those other functions, uh, and this is why I'm in this project, because I do kind of have just this existing code here, and I'm going to start playing around with these two functions. So if you wanted to generate doc strings for a function, you could simply, oh, actually, let me do this one because it's got more stuff to it. Uh, we can refactor the code block and add comments and doc strings to the code. And now it will create a doc string for us, and it actually creates it quite nicely in the same format, at least as far as I can tell, that um, it is in other places in the project. So I actually use NumPy doc in other places in the project and it's used NumPy doc here, which is quite nice. And it's given us some proper, it's actually able to work out this path like as well. So this path like is a string or path and it's done string or path here, which is really cool. Uh, it's also able to work out optional ones as well, <clears throat> return types. And one thing I thought was kind of cool, it knows that this file exists error is raised if the file already exists and overwrite is set to false. It's actually able to figure that out, which is pretty cool. So if I then accept that, then we have our doc string in our code and it did some other file formatting as well. I think it changed this to three lines and it moved this across lines. You can also get it to create unit tests for the code. So if I select this one, and do refactor select a code block, and then we click the, the generate unit test one. It will actually go through and it will it will create a, a little doc string for us, but it'll also go and create a series of unit tests. And it's actually done it a bit differently than it did last time I ran this. So last time I ran this, it created more tests actually, uh, interestingly. Uh, this time it's only created a few. But yeah, so it can use request because request is installed. It can't use do not exist or does not exist because that's not installed. And it's it's able to work out that these two are actually installed and that we can use them, which is quite nice. Uh, the other time I did it as well, it's, it used different packages. So the results will differ uh, each time. It also 
will not import unit test for us, so we would then have to go and do that. Uh, and it's not actually given us the code to run the test this time. Yeah, last time it did a, a little bit better. And to run through the rest of these refactors, to add print statements so that it can be easily debugged, is basically just sticking print statements around the place. And in type annotations, um, we'll just add types, obviously. I mean, a lot of it is self-explanatory. So it's clean up the code. Let's see what it does here, actually. Could it actually detect that it could be cleaned up? Uh, I am not sure. I think it's just changed like one variable. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Okay, fine. So apparently this function is pretty good. If we go back in here, we can check for bugs. We can implement stuff. We can uh, fix uh, MyPy and pilot errors. We can make the code strongly typed. We can also make it more efficient. Could this be done more efficiently? Uh, oh, it can oh yeah, we oh it's just you could do that on one line. Well, okay, fine. Apparently it can be done on one line. Uh, who'd have thunk it? Oh, there we go back in here. Do, 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 do. Let's find one. Verbosely comment this code so I can understand what's going on. This is probably really nice for, you know, code that you've never seen before. Say if you contributed to an open source library, you can just do this. And you can get some comments going. We'll see what sort of stuff it's done. Oh my God, it's really doing it verbose. Oh, it hasn't done anything down here. It's just done doc strings. Oh, interesting. What if I did it on this one? Does this one not work so well? Let's see. Uh, well, let's select all of it just in case it gets confused. You factor and never both see comments. I would have presumed it would have added comments and stuff. Oh, there we go. It's doing it this time. I suppose there just wasn't really any paths to do it last time. But if we go up here and we... Oh, it was still going. What the hell is it doing? <laughs> If we accept, we can see uh, it's given us a very verbose doc string, and it's given us uh, these comments as well. Uh, so we're actually able to work out what's happening here, which is really cool, actually. If you go in here, we also have this explain selected code block here. So if I move this over a little bit, we can see that it's explained this as this code snippet defines a function called can use, which takes any number of string arguments. It tries to import each using the metadata distribution function. If any of the packages are not found, it returns false. If all the packages are found, it returns true, which is correct. It will only return true if all the packages are found. I have found in certain situations, this explain is not great. <laughs> uh, this time it has actually done it quite well. Let's see if I can do this process path one, how well it does on that. Uh, but I found uh, in the past, I might actually, let me get rid of this doc string and stuff because it might try and use that and I want to give it like a proper test. Uh, do, 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 explain the code like that. And you can ask it stuff as well. So you can like ask it for help if you want it in the same way that ChatGPT can. I don't know how, how good it is with that. Uh, I haven't really touch that side of things most uh, or an awful lot. I've just had a quick read of this. It seems to have done a pretty good job at explaining that one, actually. Uh, yeah, the ones I did before, it was sort of, yeah, it was being really vague and not that great. So I suppose, oh, you can actually change the model, look. Uh, base model, uh, oh, this is a good UI. And then, oh, okay, GPT-4, there's a closed beta for it, fine. So yeah, in short, I personally think it's actually quite competent. It seems to be able to do most things fine. It does get in the way sometimes when I'm, you know, just trying to do my own thing and then it will do like code suggestions and they'll blend into the rest of the code and then it looks as though, and then I like delete something and it turns out I delete something I didn't want to. And you know, you have all those problems, but as far as I'm aware, at least what I've heard from other people, you have all these problems in chat GPT. No, I said, I've done it again, Copilot <laughs> as well. Um, so maybe that much is just unavoidable. If you are looking for something like Copilot, but you're not really sure you want to pay the £10 a month, then Codium might be the way to go for you if you do, you know, trust everything that I mentioned at the start. Uh, obviously, I know people's trust levels differ when it comes to AI, but I think it's actually pretty cool, personally. Let me know in the comments if you are already using this or if you are planning to maybe try this. If you have used Copilot in the past, and do let me know how you think it compares to it based on what you've seen here, or maybe you can try it out and compare it. Because I do want to know. Um, I'm sure there'll be plenty of other people that want to know 
how it compares to Copilot and that'll be really useful to have down there. I want to say an amazing thank you to all my members and patrons on screen now, especially Mazard Rashman III for being so generous. If you want to see how Python can be abused to have hybrid sync and async functions, and that's what I covered in the last video. And I'll see you in the next one, whatever I do next.